Hi everyone, Simon Jacobson here, another episode of Meaningful Live. A Mother's Tears, what Rachel teaches us about maternal love. This program is dedicated by Artem Karpov. A Mother's Tears. There's no person on earth that does not have a mother. We hope that we all have a mother that nurtured us and loved us unconditionally and gave us the strength and the confidence we need to take on every challenge in life. But sadly, the fact is it's not always the case. So let's talk about that. A mother's tears. What Rachel teaches us about maternal love. This is the ongoing series of applying biblical personalities, narratives to our personal lives. I want to begin with, I remember a, a very, I'll never forget, a real definitive experience I had many years ago. I think it was, I was watching something on VHS from John Bradshaw. He's from the early inner child recovery work back in the 70s and the 80s. And he was leading a workshop. I think it was on PBS. I'm not sure. And uh, he had in a room maybe 50, 60 people, men and women. And initially I was just watching it casually, but then it really grabbed my attention. In the background, firstly... Hard to capture, but I'll try to, to recreate the experience. In the background, I was hearing this sound. It was like a beating sound, very soothing, steady beat, but I couldn't place it until it took me a moment, and then I realized it was an amplified heartbeat. Heartbeat. You know, pump, 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 pump. Contract, expand, contract, expand. And if you've ever heard a heartbeat, especially for a while, there's something about it that's very, the rhythm is very soothing, very calming, it's like a wave, exactly like a cardiogram. And he had this background, in the background you hear this heartbeat. And John begins to speak, his Bratro begins to speak to the audience. And in a very, very slow and deliberate tone, is saying, this is me, your mother, speaking to you. And you, each of you, are in your mother's womb, and this is the sound you hear. For nine months, steady, you hear a heartbeat. That's the primary sound. The child in the womb is hearing its mother's heartbeat. So with that background, John Bradshaw begins to speak as a mother would speak to a child, to the child in the womb. My dear child, I've been waiting for you so long. I prepared a special room for you. Bought new linen, pajamas, clothing. I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to meet you. And I look forward to the opportunity to help protect you, shape you, educate, inspire, laugh with you, cry with you as you grow. And I will always be there for you. No matter what, know this. And background, you keep hearing the heartbeat, which also has a certain like a running water sound. Behind the heartbeat, there's the, obviously whatever is going on inside a mother's womb. And he's talking this tone. And remember, I will always be there for you. You can always turn to me. And essentially, that was the message. I don't remember all the. It's a little longer than this. And as he continues to speak about with a heartbeat beating in the background, about the love for the child, that I look forward to meet you. I look forward to take care of you. Put you in a special bedroom, in a crib, tuck you in, feed you. Literally, every person in the room begins to cry. I also began to cry. I wasn't in the room. I was watching it on a screen. But it was so powerful and everyone understands why we're crying. Because either 
it evokes memories of such words and feelings from our childhood, or the opposite, we feel that we were never told these words. We were never given those messages. We're talking about the impressionable years within our pregnancies. Nobody remembers them, so we don't even remember our first few years. You definitely don't remember what was going on during as a fetus within your mother's womb. But to me, it resonated with such a truth. In many ways, I realized that as we grow into adults and we talk about this, this indeed is what we needed and many of us are lacking. That type of unconditional love, that type of heartbeat, being completely submerged in the embryonic fluids. So when I think of a mother's tears, it's more than just tears of pain or sorrow. These are tears of joy. This is the emotional nurturing that every human being deserves. And it's interesting, that's how we are born and created. We don't just come into this hostile world. We come in well prepared. Now, if our parents, our mothers and our fathers, live up to their calling, then they just confirm and affirm and reaffirm again and again and validate this sense of absolute dignity that each of us deserves. You look at how a mother stares at her newborn child. What's going on in that exchange? It's without words. What's going on is that you deserve to be loved. You deserve everything. You're indispensable. I am just a caretaker. I didn't create you. I'm here to take care. But so many parents were either not taught that this is how they should be, or for whatever reason did not receive this love. So we live in a world where children, these innocent, vulnerable children, <clears throat> which means each one of us at some point, are defenseless and completely at the mercy of those that will take care of us or, or won't take care of us. So when we read the story in the Bible about Rachel and about the tears that she shed for her children, and later we'll read, she passes away, and later we'll learn, well, it's actually in the same chapter, but in the the unfolding saga, that she was not buried in the same place where her husband, Jacob, was buried. Or, for that matter, the other patriarchs and matriarchs, including Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca, and before that, Adam and Eve. She was buried in Bethlehem, in Beit Lechem, on the road. And when Jacob is about to pass away, he tells his son Joseph, who's the son of Rachel, Jacob's beloved wife, Rachel. He says, I don't want to stay here in Egypt. Please take me back to where my parents are buried, in Hebron, in the Marat HaMachpelah, in the burial place of the patriarchs and the matriarchs in Hebron. And you may wonder, jo- Jacob says to Joseph, why didn't I do that same di- offer that same dignity to your mother, my wife? Why is she buried on the road? Why is she buried there as well? And he said, because that's where she would have preferred to be buried because she's on the road where her children will travel. And one day, when they will travel th- from and to Jerusalem, including their difficult travels after the temple will be destroyed and they'll be exiled, Rachel, the quintessential mother, wants to be there to see her children because Rachel Mevaka Albanel, she weeps for her children. That means that certain sensitivity, and she does not want to be buried elsewhere. So, however, you explain the metaphorical and the spiritual side of it, but it's very clear that there's something, a bond that is not even limited to time and space or to even a lifetime that there's someone that cries for you, that someone that cares about you. And I want to emphasize again, tears here does not just mean when things are bad. It just means someone that cares, always cares. The single most important ingredient in life is love. Because love provides more than oxygen, the nurturing, the affirmation, the validation, the confidence we need that whatever we take on in life that we know we can take it on because we have been loved. And those that are deprived of that second-guess themselves, and they don't know if they deserve love, and they're always challenging themselves and challenging others because they don't have trust in place. So it affects our security, affects our self-esteem and self-confidence. And how you were loved 
will absolutely determine how you will love or others will love you. And we see it play itself out today. We have a crisis of intimacy, a crisis of this type of unconditional love. That's why I find this topic so close to my heart, to all of hearts, our hearts. Because you want to get to the root of an issue, you have to go back to the beginning. And the beginning begins with a heartbeat, with that absolute unconditional nurturing and love. We'll in a moment talk about, okay, what do we do if we were not given that? We'll discuss that. But it's critical to spell that out because if not, we end up, and I find this all the time, in speaking with people and counseling and advice, people usually deal with the symptoms, not with the root. And the symptom is nobody will really like, nobody likes me, I am not lovable, I have all these neurosis, or the other party is the one that has the problem. All kinds of things are identified why relationships aren't working. But very few talk about the inner core of it all, where it all began. And for obvious reasons, many of us are not even aware. That's why it's so vital. It's like when you want to address any topic, you want to know what is the standard. Even if you're not there, you want to know what is expected, what is possible, I would say. What is possible in the area of love? And what's possible is exactly as I shared with that workshop. It always remained with me because of the effect and the resonating truth of that moment. So each one of us is an absolute indispensable life. You deserve everything you, and more than everything, simply by the virtue of the fact that you were born, that you were created. The line I use in Torah Meaning for Life in my book, birth is God saying you matter. Absolutely. But most of us don't think we matter. Or we're not sure. Or we may matter in circumstantial ways. Once I'm here, I justify my existence. But am I necessary? Absolutely necessary? Would this world be different if I didn't exist? I'm almost 8 billion people on this earth. What is one grain of sand on a beach? But the single most important message that you need to know, that each of us needs to know, is that yes, you're indispensable and you're absolutely necessary. And yes, a mother is supposed to provide and validate and affirm and reaffirm that statement time and again, every second of our lives. For nine months, thank God, no matter what the mother is like, whether she's an absentee or functional or dysfunctional, there's something natural about that nurturing. I mean, obviously, God forbid, even in pregnancy, a mother can be abusive, whether she violates herself or she in some way ingests or does behavior that can affect her, her child. But generally speaking, it's a fascinating protection that we go through, and we are completely submerged in these waters and the heartbeat and all that environment that creates that sense of, of, of importance and value. The question is, what, is once, what happens after the child emerges and the umbilical cord is cut? What happens next? So if that type of attitude is maintained, that type of love and unconditional love, and care, then you'll be in far, far better shape. But what happens if it's not? Is that, are we indeed damaged goods? Is it too late? And the answer is absolutely not. Because all that that you deserve is still part of your inheritance. It's part of your legacy. It's part of your birthright. It's just that those that were supposed to provide that security and that confidence, and instead either disappeared, absentee, or criticized, invalidated, humiliated, undermined a child's dignity, either through always disapproving or, or even worse, real abuse of different sorts. So what it did was, essentially, it's, it um, obfuscated. Think of like the heart can be very healthy, but the arteries can get blocked, can get can, can, can block the flow, and in this case, blocking the flow of that connection to that deepest part of who we really are. So how, what we have to do is compensate. We have to figure out ways to self-nurture, find friends, find others, and yes, find a, find a significant other, a soulmate. Not desperately looking to that person to satisfy and fill that need, but to nurture and support who you really are. Because many of us, what happens is, 
when we need love, we become desperate, and we just turn to whoever will provide that love. So it needs to be a balance because you need to ultimately learn to nurture yourself, but also have someone that confirms that, that affirms that, that is there with you, a companion, and that has that sacred, sacred connection and commitment to you as you have to that person. I want to share this uh, story. I've shared it many times, but it's very fitting here. And this, uh, I'll, I'll give the brief version. Years ago, when after Torah and Meaningful Life was published, I traveled uh, on a book tour that uh, William Morrow, my publisher, sent me on. And among the different cities, one of them was in the uh, mid- Midwest, St. Louis. And I gave my talk that evening. And when I returned back to New York, I received this email from a woman who writes to me, I was in the audience, and I was going to come over, but there was a long line to sign books, and I wanted to share a few things. But instead, I decided to write to you, which I'm more comfortable doing regardless. This is the letter. She writes to me, I am a 47-year-old executive that by all accounts is considered a success story. I have a powerful position. I make good money, well-connected, the equity, I'm influential, I'm respected, and everyone would, I'm an envious position that many people would envy being in my position. And yet, beneath the veneer of success lies a woman in shreds. Because you see, my soul was murdered when I was a young child due to the abuse I endured at the hands of my parents. And she enumerates emotional, physical, psychological, and sexual abuse. And she says, I loathe myself from, that, from those young years. I've tried many types of therapy. Nothing's really worked. Relationships are a mess. Intimacy. I don't trust. People don't trust me. I'm always testing, testing. Always wondering if I deserve it. And it just destroys and torpedoes every relationship. So what does a person like me do? Lack of inner control. I create outer control. Outer control. Superly, superly, super driven. Very workaholic ambitious, and I climbed the corporate ladder. It doesn't really relieve my pain, but at least it gives me something to work toward. Every day is a struggle, sometimes against suicide. And I've long given up hope. You know, I just go day by day and just manage. Someone gave me a copy of your book, Toward a Meaningful Life. I'm Jewish, but completely unaffiliated. I don't want to associate with anything my parents ever was related to. So I was just leafing through the pages, and the line jumped out at me. What line? In the beginning of the chapter of birth, birth is God saying, you matter. And I read it a second time. Birth is God saying, you matter. And a third time, birth is God saying, you matter. I will read that line the rest of my life. Because for some reason, at 47 years old, I suddenly discovered, like a silver bullet between my eyes, this resonating message that despite what everybody says around me, despite what my parents said and did to undermine my very being, my very value, my very existence, despite what corporate America says that your value is nothing more than a statistic on someone's balance sheet based on your productivity and your buying power and your looks and your youth and how others uh, need you or can, can, or can benefit from you, despite all of that, I matter to the one that matters most, God, who created me. So even if I don't perform on a certain day, or I don't have that buying power, or I don't have the looks or the youth, that remains intact. The work I have cut out for me, and I still have work to do, she writes, and this can be eloquent if it weren't under the circumstances, she writes, is to create bypass surgery, to bypass the infected arteries that were clogged due to the abuse, and reconnect to that pure moment when I was born. And God said, you're my child, you're indispensable. No one can ever take that from you because no one ever gave that to you. So I have my work cut out for me. I said, thank you. She concludes, thank you for giving me back my life. You can imagine the tears, talk about tears, that shed from my eyes reading that. Just the sheer experience. And someone sharing, a complete stranger sharing with me his sacred confidence. I went back to read the chapter, even though I had written it. But a book, once you've written it, it belongs to the reader, not to you any longer. I wanted to see it from her eyes. 
And I wrote her back, obviously offering my friendships, my support, my friendship support in any way I can. I asked her permission to tell the story. She asked, don't give me permission. I said, please don't share my name and don't give anyone my number. I know many people want to call me to com comfort me, console me, or they have similar stories. We stay in touch. Still struggles. She still struggles, but it's a very different type of human being. I learned so much from her and from this uh, communication, this correspondence. I learned that the real thing that makes you matter is not because your parents told you you're great or because somebody gives you a compliment or you have plaques on your wall. It's because you fundamentally are valuable. It's a divine thing. It's not man-made. And no one can take it away from you. Now, you needed someone. Sometimes you need the eclipse of the sun to appreciate sunlight. I grew up in a home. I'm the oldest of five children, somewhat spoiled. I never had to ask that question. I always thought I mattered. Not necessarily for the right reason, because I had no reason to question why I wouldn't matter. But this woman did not have that luxury. So she came to the, true, the real truth. Now, when you have good parents, they confirm that, as I mentioned. They affirm it. They validate. They bring it alive in your life. But you have it at the, at the core of your essence. So no matter what happens in life, and if your mother did not weep for you, did not cry for you, so there's someone else who's crying for you. It may be God. It may be friends. It may be others that are like a mother, like a mother figure. But it's vital to know that, in God forbid, if we, did not have, if we have that void and we did not have that nurturing that was necessary, it doesn't mean it's impossible to gain. You have to never give up. You have to keep looking. Like in this woman's case, what she did was she bypassed. Yes, she created bypass surgery. She went back to discover her soul and came to learn how to nurture her soul and herself and not be defined by other people's expectations and needs and learn to see that it's coming from within. Is it difficult? Of course it's difficult. But that's the work to be done. And then what happens is you begin to discover that right that you have so in the case of Rachel, she continues to weep for all of us. The Kabbalists, the mystics tell us that Rachel continues to weep for us. We have a mother. We have a mother that watches us. She's on the road, both literally and, and, and figuratively, meaning on the road with us in our journeys, not just somewhere in a burial plot in the Hevra, which is also powerful, but she's as close as possible and watches and cares and we have to connect to it by connecting to our souls. As I always say, submerge yourself in a spiritual spa, study, prayer, action, cognitive and emotional and behavioral conditioning to recognize that you have everything you need to have that absolute value. And there is someone that cares, and there's more than someone. And when you understand and recognize that, not just cerebrally, but also emotionally and in action, by doing something every day that validates your value and who you are by contributing, by volunteering, by helping others. And the same thing emotionally, emotionally connecting to this concept. And maybe, yes, maybe you should listen to a heartbeat while also listening to the words that you should have heard if you haven't heard or words that you did hear that need to be heard again and again that I've been waiting for you. You have something to contribute that you and only you can do and that you have the forces around you that are willing and committed to do everything possible to help you grow in that fashion. And the people in your life and the job you have and everything else, if, that's, if it supports this message, great. And if it doesn't, that's not where you're going to get your sustenance, your true sustenance. And this is what we need to do. We have to create that type of oasis where we hear and feel and experience that emotion, those tears. And tears bathe us. They do soothe and bathe us and calm and, um, in many ways, nurture us to become, as the expression goes, from when you sow in tears, you reap with joy. So may we all experience that type of growth, and even the pains in our lives can also be turned into some form of deeper emotional uh, experience, deeper emotional cleansing, if you wish, deeper emotional growth, and that we live up to what we deserve, and that is the birthright that we have, that you absolutely matter. And there is a mother watching and caring over you. And if your mother is able to do so, in your physical, biological mother, great. And if not, for whatever reason, or it's somewhat limited, 
it, it, we have recourse and we have alternatives. God bless you all and know that you are loved unconditionally. This is Simon Jacobson, MeaningfulLife.com. This is what we do. Try to provide that type of environment. Try to help each other. We all need each other in this context. So be blessed. And please, love to hear your feedback, your thoughts, your comments. And of course, if you find this meaningful, please share, like, uh, all the different terms used to pass the word on. And um, be blessed. Thank you so much.